Now, Barbara, while we look at this elephant bull, you say, can a stray elephant come in on an established herd? No, not normally, Barbara. Well, uh, no, that's, that's not necessarily true. They wouldn't really want to. Could they? Yes, they probably could. So, I mean, a stray elephant would be an elephant that had lost the rest of its herd. And so a bull wouldn't want to because a bull would be on his own by default. Uh, but uh, I suppose a young cow could definitely join a herd if she wanted to. Wonderful stuff. And look who's coming. Look at this absolute behavior coming across the clearing. Enormous elephant bull coming lumbering across the clearing. He is massive. Huge tusks. I wouldn't trifle with him. Hello, Mumsy in Cincinnati. Thank you for talking to us. How much training does a father elephant give? How much? How important is his mentorship? Mentorship is very important, Mumsy. And, you know, we don't know exactly, but we do know that in areas where elephants have been reintroduced and there have been no big mature bulls, often young bulls will go what we call rogue. And they become very difficult. Ones like the one behind there, they become quite difficult. And they kill rhino sometimes, they kill hippo, they kill other animals. And then if you import big bulls like that chap in front to kind of mentor them through the, their, their passage into adulthood, you find that everything turns out okay. Isn't that beautiful? And there goes our friend, all the zebras. I think we're in for a bit of a treat here. These elephants are now going to meet up. The zebra are not going to come and have a drink while those fellows are knocking about here. Let's see how their meeting goes. This could be very cool. That's the sound of a child you can hear calling um, on another vehicle. The birds are getting upset. This is fantastic. Now, the big bull is waiting behind while the two youngsters meet. Oh, that's quite angry. That's very angry, in fact. And see how the big one comes in and they back off. This is fantastic. This is just amazing. Isn't that great? So the young chap just had his drink and he's been told to clear off. Oh wow. This is too marvellous. We're very, very lucky indeed. Right, we will just um, just keep a, keep awake here because they might show their displeasure with us. I'm going to move back slightly, just so that they have space. Should they want to come down here, and so that I can drive off frontwards if I need to. How's that, Brian? That is an immense, massive, massive, massive elephant, everyone. Oh, that's incredible. That is too wonderful. Hello, boy. I hate myself for saying that. <laughs> Isn't he cool? <laughs> He's so cool. He's so huge. We 
can hear other elephants in the background there. Right. He's quite an impressive fellow. So I would say he stands probably everybody about nine, maybe ten feet at the no, ten feet at the shoulder. I'd say he's probably thirty. He will get bigger. He will fill out even more than he is now. <laughs> this is so wonderful. We're only sitting everyone about ten meters from him, so about thirty feet. And he seems completely comfortable with us at the moment. Let's hope that maintains. And you can hear the, all the Senegal lapwings behind us. Oh, this is wonderful. There they go. All flying around, and they're flying around in a mixed flock of crowned lapwings and Senegal lapwings together. And this chap seems to be pretty chilled with us. <laughs> it's really wonderful. And the zebra all still there. They're definitely not going to come and try and have a drink now. They'll be much too nervous. James, a very nice question from you, and it's a common one, and it's a good one. Is there some reason you beast of burden in the same way as his age, age and cousin is? There are a few good reasons. The first one is that the African elephant, of course, evolved in Africa with human beings. They therefore have a much more natural fear of us, a much more... Um, kind of instinctual dislike of us if you want if you know what I mean because we've been hunting them for as long as we have been standing on two legs now if you try and tame them they're more likely to try and sort of knock you down than are their Indian brethren at the same time they are also in need of much more food than Indian elephants they have evolved in an area where the nutrients are poorer in the soil, so they have a digestive system that allows them to process a great deal more food, and they have to eat a lot more food than, than their Indian counterparts. So that, combined with, uh, I suppose, a lack of need for them out here, I mean, I suppose they could have been used for transport, but um, they just never have been used for transport, except when Hannibal, of course, used them to go over the Alps to Carthage, at least from Carthage interestingly but those are the reasons you can use them for beasts of burden and they are certainly used in, and i know that there's a hugely controversial you know topic around riding african elephants and certainly there seems to be some very bad press about it and it's it's goodness for the actual animal but it can be done so you can domesticate an african elephant but i believe it's a lot more than domesticating its Asian cousin. You'd still be utterly astounded by his size. He's listening to me, you know. Yes. And you hear the birds starting up again. <coughs> His wizened old eyes. The gentle sound of him blowing the water into his mouth. It always sounds like such a slow sigh. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Now, 
from the right hand wing there come the zebras there they are <laughs> I think we're going to walk into frame <laughs> long before that did that. <laughs> now I don't know if you can notice everybody but you can see maybe that the the light is already starting to fade and it's because oh, the sun is about to set it's just about to go down and these zebras will want to have a bit of a drink before the sun goes down lovely big herd of zebra and now Grace if you're still watching that's two or three different herds that have come together and often they do that in winter because they all like to come and drink at the same time so I'm sorry everybody about the pixelation apparently you will hear me fine but all you can probably see is a sort of Picasso like artwork of what we're looking at now so there's the elephant having a drink that's what you're looking at at the moment the zebras are coming around the outside, thinking about having a drink. There are doves, there are birds. It is the most exquisite evening here on Cheetah Plains. Very nice, not so, Brian? Mm. It's so delightful. So magnificently splendid. <laughs> Splendiferously magnificent, Brian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One slammer shot with a cell phone. As one should. As one does. One might be sorry about that, everybody. Right, once we've had a look. Well, in fact, let's do it now. Let's go ahead across to Byron, everybody, and find out what he's got to show you. I think he's still on Arethusa. Isn't that fantastic, James? All those animals coming down to drink, and there was a lot of interaction. Incredible. It's always fantastic and wonderful to see different species in the same area. We have come back onto, onto Juma and we are driving around heading in the direction of Falls Hook Dam. Hopefully we'll get something down at the water hole. Uh, the temperature has definitely dropped quite a bit since the, since the sun has started to set. And there seems to be a calm and a stillness in the bush at the moment. Not even much bird activity, which is interesting. I wonder, I think just before they, they all start falling later, the final calls for the afternoon, so maybe it's just a little still patch that we've, we've hit. We are pitching and I'm still learning my way around and VM's giving me some some on where to drive and what to look for. Beautiful time of the afternoon. Still this golden light. I think if I just stop through here, if you have a look in front of us, just this little view that we've got. Look at that color. We spoke about it earlier. Beautiful orange, yellow, green, light green. Just a fantastic, fantastic coloration that we are getting from this afternoon sunlight. It's beautiful. No, it's so so great to be able to to appreciate the, you know these these types of scenes and the the scenery that we are seeing or get to see every day. I really love it. It's so calming and so peaceful.
think we are going to have a beautiful sunset this evening. And I think let's head back to James. Sounds like he's got more elephant for you. So this elephant is obviously very, very thirsty, everybody. He hasn't gone anywhere. He's still lurking right here, enjoying his drink. The sun is setting behind him. The zebras are much too scared to come and have a drink with him here. And we're just having a wonderful time. We're just, Brian and I are sitting here marveling at the golden light, the zebras knocking about the place, the beautiful elephant in front of us, not more than 30 feet away. And he's just drinking quietly away. Very, very lucky, and you can just see, you can see that the light is now faded. It's not so gold over them anymore, they've just gone into the shade, and as the sun starts to set, it really does get quite a lot cooler. They will eventually be able to come down and have a drink, I'm sure. Look at him turning to us now. I'm just getting reports on my radio here of possible lions. There we go. I think he's going to move off now. I'm going to reverse very slightly so that you can get a look just before the sun goes down. Well, maybe not just yet. He's too wonderful. He's smelling us. Just deciding if he's ready to move on or not. Isn't that Awesome. <laughs> it's the most incredible shot. Look at the hairs, the dripping water, those unbelievable prehensile tips to his trunk. And prehensile means, of course, everyone, that he's able to use those to pick up individual marula fruits if he wants to. And you can see the two nostrils. That is too fantastic. Now, he's interacting with us, everyone. There's no doubt in my mind that what he's doing is listening to us. He's assessing. And I keep saying this, and I'm going to keep saying it until I'm sort of proved wrong. There's a boredom about an elephant's life, I think. And I think that their interest in social interaction extends to kind of seeing what we want. I guess we're slightly, a little bit of a challenge to him. That's why those zebras didn't come up here. They weren't interested in engaging with an animal this size. Isn't that special? All right, I'm going to suggest we move. I'll tell you why, for two reasons. One, I would like to show you the sunset. And two, I think we're being unfair to these zebra. I think they're not going to come and have a drink while we're sitting over here. And I think they've been waiting very patiently for quite a long time. Let's have a quick look at the sun and then we're going to move down into the clearings. Isn't that stunning? Hello, Cat and Tampa. You're wondering if the two stallions from these two or three different herds will have a fight with each other. Cat, I think you've only to watch them to see that no, they won't. And I don't mean that facetiously at all. They're clearly not engaging with each other, and that's simply because they're not trying to steal each other's wives. That is the reason that zebra do fight with each other, when they're trying to get another female or trying to uh, sort of uh, pick up a new wife. And normally, a zebra mare, once she has been sort of uh, not kidnapped, but once uh, she's found her partner, normally they remain totally faithful. And so there's no real point for them to fight. 
if a young male were to come in here and to try and abduct, they call it abduction, one of the young females, then a stallion might fight. But if it's two sort of settled kinship groups or family groups, no, then they're not going to fight with each other, cat. They'll just uh, take it easy. Here comes a brave one to have a drink. Yeah. We could wait here. Let's give it two minutes. Because we might get an unbelievable sighting of them drinking. But if they're not, if they still look nervous after two minutes, we're going to move on and let them be. Well, there we go, Bethany. Bethany, you, you make a very good point. You say, when two zebras sit together, it's difficult to tell where one bit begins and the other ends. And you say, could that be an adaptation to making them look bigger for their predators? Bethany, not bigger, but yes, absolutely. I think what it does is make it difficult for their predators to tell where one starts and where one uh, ends. Look at the lovely reflection there. Isn't that special? Beautiful. There's another vehicle coming along here. I'm so reticent to start the engine. I just think that they, they've, they're coming closer and closer and closer and we're getting such a beautiful reflection there. And they're now watching another car coming. They must be thinking to themselves, when are we going to have the water to ourselves? everyone I think let's move on I just don't I think we're, we're stopping them from coming to drink I don't think that's fair all right let's head across to Byron and get an idea of what he's doing uh, probably still on Arethusa not sure you find out we have just found a beautiful lioness lying up at Biffles Hook Dam I'm so happy I was starting to get worried there for a second thought James was getting all the attention. Uh, <laughs> how beautiful is this? And just with this last bit of golden light on her face, have a look at that. Interesting, I don't see any other lions around. It's just her by herself. I can't see her front. I understand that a few guys were asking about these lions in the area and and whether or not this female is perhaps lactating so we can't really see from this angle and uh, I'm not sure which pride this line is from if anybody any of the viewers has got any idea they can please send us their answers and we might be able to get a better idea of where this lioness comes from and if we do think she is lactating which could mean all The line dynamics are And I think those were 
perhaps this female and a few others. It'll be interesting to try and find out. Ah, oh, look at that. Cleaning herself. I'm not too sure if she has gone down and had a drink already. I would assume she possibly has. But you never know. We might be lucky. She might go down and have another drink. Lions tend to drink a lot of water when they can, when the water is available, because they can go for quite some time without, without any water. You can see those beautiful black tips on those beautiful black tips on the on the ears. You can see them clearly. And that's a, those are all markings that have been put there for a reason and these lines have adapted to have those markings specifically for a few reasons. One of them is um, the, the theory is that it's a following mechanism. When these lionesses are walking through the through the long grass and they've got perhaps cubs or other lions following them, they can see the black tip of the tail or the black tip behind the ears, black tips, and they're able to follow each other that way. The um, other reason is when they are aggressive, they pin those ears forward and you see those black tips very clearly. So it's an aggressive sign. So Roger has asked if the lioness is possibly waiting for prey. Good question, Roger. Yeah, she, she possibly could be lying out waiting for something to come down to drink. The only thing is she's right out in the open. So the chances of her really having a, a good chance of hunting anything out here is, are quite slim. Let's have a look as she turns over there. You see those be uh, belly? Uh, I don't see any big teeth, so I don't think it, uh, there's a chance of her having cubs or potentially, let's see again, uh, maybe they do look a little swollen, perhaps she is pregnant. Okay, and I have just got an update and I understand that the Unkahumas were denning around this area. So this is possibly this lioness from the Unkuhuma Pride. So this is very exciting, really great. This is this is my first lion, I think. Yeah, my first lion that I've seen on Safari Live uh, or while I've been here. So this is very exciting for me. It's always nice to see these new animals. You don't know where they come from. Uh, you know, you get to learn the story, and I'll probably sit with James tonight and find out a bit more information about them. So lucky to be able to see her out in the open. <laughs> I'm so happy that we got to see her. This is fantastic. Wonderful elephant herd earlier, and now this lioness. And as I was saying earlier, we were driving and it was very calm. Very peaceful, not too many birds. Now the birds are all chirping. We've got red-billed buffalo weavers in the nests above the water hole. And, uh, and a few other birds calling in the distance. It's like these last calls for the, for the afternoon before, before, the animal, or before the birds and all go to sleep. can see that beautiful torchwood tree in the right hand side of the picture as VM zooms in a little bit closer see those big nests on the left hand side of the tree those are the red billed buffalo weaver nests you can hear the birds chirping loudly from there they, uh, they are very social birds so community nesting birds there will be a number of pairs all within that nest 
a, a really, really great scene here. So, Joey in Australia has just asked what one of my most memorable lion sightings have been. Um, I've got I've got one or two, Joey, and one of them I'll never forget when I started guiding. I we had tracked and found uh, a pride of lions, and there were two big dominant males with these lions. And uh, these these males, it was warming up in the morning. It was getting quite quite hot, and one of the males got up and decided to move over towards the vehicle. And I think he wanted the shade of the vehicle. I've had it a few times, but this being my first time, you know, seeing lions and tracking, finding them, and having these big males close to us, this one male walked straight towards us and lay literally at the footwell of the vehicle, right next to me, in the shade of the vehicle. Uh, the, I must admit, I got quite nervous. And the tracker I was with at the time had a good chuckle to himself. One of the vehicles passing us so quickly. Someone from Chile Plains. Also got to see the lioness. Hello, Hello everyone. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> what I will do is see if we can get a, another position, maybe on the other side of this lioness, and see if we can get a nice view of her face. The so lying down and then the water off behind her. So Joey, yeah, so that was one of the, the m more memorable lion sightings. And recently I was fortunate enough to see some lionesses hunting buffalo in a riverbed. And they chased the buffalo bull, jumped on his back, and three lionesses were jumping on this buffalo and trying to pull him down. But he was a big, strong bull, and he managed to shake two of them off. And with the last one hanging on, he actually ran into the river. And the last lioness let go, and he ran straight through out onto the other side, joined the herd and ran off. They're incredibly tough animals, very, very powerful. So that was another very memorable lion sighting. Let me see if I can reposition for us quickly. Keep an eye on this lioness so long. I'm just going to drive around. See if we can get a nice view from the other side. So, Tasha has asked the interesting question about the lionesses and at what age do the lionesses have their first cubs? So Tasha, I have seen lionesses start mating from about two and a half, three years old and if they are lucky they will probably fall pregnant at the age of about three, three and a half. I'm just going to go up onto the dam wall and we'll come back around and view her from, from that side. Oh, she is really posing for us nicely up in the on the open dam wall. Oh, and we have a hippo in the dam. The one that I think you are all used to seeing. Not sure where the other one is, the young, younger, younger hippo. I'm sure it's in there somewhere. Just move a little bit closer to the female. Don't want to disturb it too much. Just a little bit more. There we go. It. Wonderful, look at that. This morning, when we had Mvula, that big male leopard, or that old male leopard, uh, there was a question about the size of his tracks compared to a lioness, lioness's paws. And have a look at the size of the paws on that lioness. They are very, very big. Much, much larger than a male leopard. Uh, and not, 
not nearly as big as a male lion, but, uh, but the lioness's tracks are larger than a leopard's. Or male leopard at least. He's very relaxed. So Cecilia in the UK has asked if this lioness, or if it looks like this lioness has eaten recently. So Cecilia, it 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 looks like it, but with those large nipples of the of the or teats of the of the female, it um, and with her lactating, she may look a little bit fuller than she actually is. But that belly does look quite big, so I, I do think she has eaten quite recently. And that's possibly also why there are a lot of tracks around this area. Maybe they did have a kill. We're not too far from Biffle's Hook. Maybe they had something to eat on that side. And they've come down to this, this water hole. It is a possibility. But yeah, she's definitely not hungry. That belly is, is fairly rounded. So it does look like she has eaten in the last day or so. And again with this beautiful cool temperature now, I think that is why she decided to come out earlier. Come out to the waterhole, probably went and had a drink already and then came and lay up on the damn wall. It's not hot, she doesn't have to lie in the shade. It's a perfect spot for her in case something does come down to drink. She can maybe have a look and try her luck. But she is quite exposed here, so I don't think she would have any luck, you know. Anything, and we spoke about it yesterday too, anything that comes down to water to drink, they are very alert, very aware, because they know when they put their heads down to drink, they are a little bit more vulnerable. So they're very careful, very cautious, just to make sure there are no predators around. We're going to sit here a little longer with this lioness, see what she gets up to. Why don't you go across to James and get an update from him and see what he's up to. Ah! <sighs> we are just basking in the glory of our sighting that we had earlier. And I'm out of the car because it's got a little chilly and I know that we're heading for home soon. So I'm going to put on my jugget. I need to unplug myself in order to do that, and I'll become almost immobile because I will resemble the Michelin Man. For those of you in northern climes, you would find the idea of putting an extra jacket on in temperatures like this utterly ridiculous. But um, for those of us who live out here, where anything below 20 degrees is considered utterly frigid, well, it's pretty normal. Brian, how many jackets have you got on? Um, four. Four jackets. Four jackets. <laughs> Only four this time. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably 15 degrees or 16, so it's really not cold yet. It's the wind. The it's wind the wind. It's a brutal the wind. wind. A brutal, a brutal, brutal howling gale that we're experiencing here. Anyway. How many jackets do you have on, James? Two jackets. Oh, oh. And a scarf. And a scarfie. And a beanie. And a beanie. Mm. And a blankie for my leggies. <laughs> my little chicken leggies. Right, I feel very comfortable now, Brian. I might pop. Go one more turn past here. <laughs> Hello, Joey. You say, I asked you earlier where you are in Australia. You say you're from southeast Queensland. Thank you very much for that. It's nice to know. And you say, could we see baby ostriches around here? Actually, Brian and I were just talking about baby ostriches. He was saying that the best ostrich sighting he ever had was in the Kalahari with baby ostriches. A male and a female, how many babies? Uh, Twelve little chickens. So big. Twelve little <laughs> ones the size of a Franklin. Um, so they are around. Uh, here, yeah, it's possible. We've seen a male and a female. We've seen them doing a bit of a courtship dance. So it's quite possible that they might come together at some stage. Um, and 
maybe they will produce little babies around here. I mean, they have to have got here somehow. It's unlikely, but simply because we don't see them very often. But it's not impossible at all. So, Joey, in southeast Queensland, are you... I mean, I'm imagining you're about 10 hours in front of us. Could it be that much? Must be about 8 or 10 hours in front of us. Right, let's go up through here. 10 hours. That is a long time. So it is now... Of course, it's very late tomorrow, actually. Early tomorrow, sorry, in Queensland. And you're only 14 years old. <laughs> Grief, you have some very uh, lenient parents allow you to be up at this time of the day. No, nothing else happening at the pan. I just thought we'd do one quick loop around here and see if anything had uh, exploded out of the bushes, perhaps to eat those zebra, but nothing has. So we'll make our way gently and slowly back towards the west. Hello, Roger. Roger, you want to know about crocodiles, and you say in the rainy season, are the crocodiles, or is the water ever get high enough for the crocodiles to be in? Not really in these areas. You might find a crocodile once or twice in Buffelshook Dam, where Byron is sitting with that lion, um, when it gets full. But crocodiles tend to be fairly transient in areas like this. They like permanent water in a river. So they don't really like to live in dams. They will live in dams if they have to. At the reserve I used to work called Ngala, which is about 15 kilometers to the north of us. There used to be a, um, there used to be a pair of crocodiles that lived in an enormous dam there. But only that pair. There were never more than the two of them there. But that's not to say that they wouldn't come past. So, I've often said this, I would never swim in something like Biffleshook Dam, no matter how many times I'd been there and never seen a crocodile, because crocodiles can often just come into an area for a couple of days and then leave, and you don't see them lurking below the surface of the water. And of course, to be attacked by a crocodile, I imagine, is a fate uh, that couldn't really be matched by too many other horrible fates. So they can be around, but it's unlikely that we'll see them up here. Definitely if you go down towards the Sand River. Right, let's go back to Bilvazook Dam. The lion, I think, is asleep. We are still sitting here with this lioness. And who is still resting very peacefully on the dam wall. Very comfortable, hasn't moved. Vim and I were just chatting and we think there's definitely, well there should be, and from the tracks we had this morning and yesterday, there should be at least two other lines in this area somewhere. So we're waiting and hopefully they might come out a little bit later. No ostriches here either, James. <laughs> I know James was, was chatting about ostriches. Um, but none in this area that I've seen. Amazing, you think that lioness is completely fast asleep, but she is still very, very alert, always aware of what's happening around them. So, Celia has asked us when a lion or lioness looks at you um, or looks directly into your eyes, does your heart skip a beat? Yes, it does. <laughs> I mean, I think when any, any wild animal walks up too close and kind of gives you a look, then uh, you do feel a little bit nervous and the heart does skip a beat. You know, at the end of the day, these are still wild animals. We are very fortunate that we're able to get reasonably close to them and you never really know how they might react if they feel threatened. No animal is, is really dangerous unless they feel threatened, unless you really push the boundaries too much. But, uh, but they are wild animals and you do still have to have a lot of respect for them. So 
So Darlene from New Hampshire has asked a question about a pride of lions which are generally found um, in the kind of well, south of here. And um, they, they came from Londolosi. I'm not too sure when Darlene actually saw those lions. Uh, called, it's a Salala pride. And Darlene was saying that this Salala lioness gave birth to three cubs. But she has raised them or has kept them close to the pride and been moving them around with the pride. Now, Darlene wants to know, is that unusual, or, or how does that, or why does that occur? I think, Darlene, what often happens, and I'm not too sure what age those cubs are at the moment, but lionesses, when they do give birth, they do move off away from the pride, and I'm sure that lioness did too. She, um, she most likely found a den site, an area where she could hide the cubs, give birth to them. They are completely vulnerable when they are born. So the first two months, those cubs will be hidden in a den site, at least. And then what happens is once they reach two and a half to three months, she will bring them out and introduce them to the pride. The reason for that is she wants the rest of the pride to get used to the cubs. And she will then allow them to stay around with the pride from then on. What will happen though is when the adult lionesses go off to hunt, they will hide the cubs in a thicket somewhere, or in a safe area, and then they will then return, call the cubs, and take them to where that kill is, so that they may also start feeding on some meat. So I think that's possibly what has happened there, Darlene. I don't think she would have given birth to them out in the open and had them with the pride from the beginning. Probably waited two months or so, and then she would have introduced them to the pride, which is very natural behavior for lions. interesting when the lionesses do introduce cubs back to the pride they are still very very nervous and and careful of the big dominant males the males just generally can get a little bit aggressive at times especially around a kill so the lionesses are always wary they even though the males could be the father they um or are definitely the fathers they're still careful because if the if the males get a bit aggressive around a kill and swat a cub with a, a paw those paws are so big and those lions are so powerful they can easily kill a cub if they are not careful so they just generally are cautious of the big males being around lioness just changing position there for a second giving us her back See a grey heron has just taken off from a tree behind us and moving, moving directly behind us. I don't think we'll see it, but probably a heron that frequents this waterhole or this dam. Trace this waterhole. The hippo hasn't moved, it's still in there, relaxing. Might leave the waterhole a little bit later this evening to go and feed. I'm almost certain it will. And hippo can cover quite a distance when they are looking for food up to five or ten kilometers in an evening if they have to and uh, there you see it's still lying in the water especially now in these dry dry drier times or drier conditions they will have to cover a much larger distance to go and look for substantial grass to feed on this lioness is lying with her head up at the moment which is quite a good sign. Uh, you never know, she may decide to get up and, and move around a bit for us. And walk off somewhere. Or put her head back down <laughs> and rest some more. <laughs> So hopefully James is heading back from Cheetah Plains and he hasn't got too lost down there. Why don't you go and get an update from him and see what he has and we're going to sit here with this lioness for a bit longer.
Hello everybody, uh, we haven't found anything alive, but we have found something dead, and of course I'm very homesick for my little tenty on quarantine clearings. There's a bone over there, and it looks quite interesting, I'm just going to go and get it and see if I can identify what it is. Brian, you'll tell me if you see a lion coming bounding out of the bushes towards me, won't you? Thank you. Hmm. Now, this is not an insubstantially heavy piece of bone. That was a stump over which I tripped. Now, oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm actually quite bad at this. Uh, this is from a giraffe, I'm going to guess. And I'm going to say that it is... I think that's the knee. What do you think, Brian? Mm. I think that's the knee joint, and I think this is probably, therefore, the humerus, the front. Not the knee joint, it would have been... You see, this is where I get so deeply confused. If it's the front, everybody, I think this is the bit that goes down to the, um, down to the wrist joint, so it would be the radius and the ulna, and that would make sense, because that then would be the radius, and that would be the ulna. So you've got two bones in your forearm, the radius and the ulna. The thick one going to your thumb is the ulna, and the radius goes around towards your baby finger. And I think that's what this is, the equivalent of. There we are. And in the absence of a better idea of the anatomy of giraffe, I'm going to say that's what it is. I've become rather fascinated with which bones are which and their um, sort of equivalents on our bodies and in the bodies of all other mammals. 270 bones apparently in the human body and it's actually not that difficult to learn them all because you've got two of most of them so you can divide that in half already so half of 270 Brian is of course 135 and then in some cases you've got you can sort of extract the eight or nine bones of the skull so it's not so many there you've got about 120 then you've got five sort of odd little bones in your wrists and five odd little bones in your feet so that takes another 10 out and so we sit at about well I don't know let's say 110 or so and then the rest are really not too hard once you've got rid of the ribs and all of the cervical vertebra at least all of the vertebrae in your spine, a couple in your arms and a couple in your legs and your fingers and your toes and suddenly you're at 110 and you feel like a doctor. Not quite. Do you get my drift? <laughs> oh, Tony. <laughs> Tony, thank you for reminding us. Remember, we, <laughs> Brian is now giggling. We, did a, we, we found a skeleton of the Nyala that the lions had been eating. We called him Nigel, the Nyala. And uh, Tony, you want to know what happened to him? I was trying to prepare him for our TV show. And by prepare him, I put him in a box full of flesh-eating beetles. And by the time the TV show came around, Tony, um, they had done a very poor job of cleaning him. And I, we had collected so many other bones that I thought, should I take it to Nigel with a scrubbing brush, uh, some rubber gloves and a sort of healthy dose of smelling salts or just use what we have and I decided on the latter and I've left Nigel in the box full of flesh eating beetles and I hope that in the next month or so they will complete eating him and then Nigel will make a return to the screen. <laughs> Brian, have you, you haven't posted your video yet. <laughs> Brian put a, um, we did a, I don't know if any, how many of you are watching, but when I, well, I picked up this, this, oh, hello beefies, some beefies next to us. We'll just have a quick say hi to them. They don't like the light, they get very nervous. So we'll leave them there. It's much lighter on your screen than it is in reality, everyone. So I'm just going to drive past them. We've got the big bright lights on the side of the car. So we had this Nyala and before we came live with it, 
I was holding it and Brian was say, and I was swinging it around and then I was kind of doing a bit of a dance with it and its mouth was flapping up and down like this and it looks like it looks totally disembodied and you, can, you don't even notice my hands so Brian filmed this thing and he's put it to music and it looks like the Nyala's carcass is kind of dancing to the music it's the most astoundingly morbidly hilarious thing you'll ever see so I'll try and persuade Brian to to, to, to post it <laughs> maybe you have to be there Right, if we do lose you now, it's because we're leaving Cheetah Plains, but we should be alright for now. All I got was a beep there. Brian, did you hear anything? Just a beep. She beeping at us. You never know, everybody. You don't want to miss a communication. She's a terrifying woman. She's got red hair, you know. Lack of soul. Lack of soul. No like me so she'd like us to link across to Byron so let's do that while we get the cheetah planes face um, slightly west now I heard lions calling oh here we go listen listen oh fantastic Incredible was that. As I was saying, there were lines calling in the distance, very faint call, but she picked up her head, she could hear it very clearly. She was obviously just returning a call, not sure if it's part of her pride. Lionesses will also communicate and roar for territorial purposes, just like males do. Um, so, this is a, what an incredible sound. Probably the most amazing sound you can hear in the bush if you are close to a lion very deep roar and it echoed across this dam which we are sitting at at the moment such a great sound beautiful pinkish pinkish reddish orangey color in the sky at the moment in the background with the sun, the sun that has gone down look at that what a scene. A lion roar, it does not get better than this. Wasn't that incredible? I understand James was showing you a bone that he found. I didn't think uh, or realize he took up archaeology. This is very interesting. Fossils? <laughs> I'll have to ask him about that later. understand James thought it was from a giraffe I hope he was right I'll sit here for a few more minutes just watch this and then she's picked up her head uh, and it is such a beautiful scene it wait to see if she does move maybe we're lucky and we get another if there's a call from the distance again Look at that. The lion and the lioness. I would like to have the nest. Uh, like half cats do. Tash do not. Lions and Abbey do not. The cat, which is a house cat or similar to a house cat, is a cheetah. In fact, that is the only big cat which purrs. The voice box and that of the of the lion and of the leopard, they do not purr. They give this very deep roar, which we just heard. So, but interesting question. Oh, there's a yawn. A beautiful yawn. Oh, another sound. I think that was just a breathing out. 
another good yawn and a stretch. There we go. Let's see what she decides to do. All right, everybody, sit still. She may walk right past us. <laughs> Sounds like she's giving some low contact calls over there. Yep, there's another line calling um, kind of southwest of where we are. And there she goes again. Do you see how those muscles in her, in her back tense up while she's roaring? They give, they put so much effort into it. Um, it's incredible how far that sound can travel. Those other lines we heard sounded a lot closer. They seem to be heading in this direction. Possibly, and I'm almost certain they are communicating with each other, may, may, might be the rest of the pride. And maybe we're lucky and we get them meeting up. Let's see where this line this is going. Just going to have a look quickly. It's reverse. It's incredible to hear a lion roar. Where has she gone? I've just lost her now for a second. There she is. There we go. VM spotted her. Thank you. Again, my multitasking is being tested here. I'll have to ask James for some more tips on this later too. <laughs> there she goes. to be heading in the opposite direction from those other calls that we heard but then again these lines or lines in general their communication is so much better than than ours and they're, they're roaring they definitely know how to pick each other up and which direction the calling is coming from they're so accurate with, with pinpointing where the sound is coming from Help a bit here. Getting a quick lesson on lighting here while we're following this beautiful lioness. Have a look while she's walking, she's constantly smelling. You know, their senses are very, very in tune to what's around them, and they can pick up any, an, any animals that have moved through the area in the last few hours or any potential prey species. The sense of smell is incredible. Oh, that roar was really, really phenomenal to hear. And I've been fortunate in the past I've managed to see four big male lions, dominant male lions lying in front of us and all roaring at the same time. And that is an incredible sound. 
the male lion roar is a little bit longer, a little bit deeper than the females, but if you often uh, quite far from them, you've got to listen very carefully. It's not always easy to tell the difference. They do sound very different. I mean, very similar. And um, and at a distance, it's hard to tell the difference. Michelle from New Jersey has asked us or made a comment about this lioness saying she wonders if this lioness could possibly move down into the drainage line close to the dam which is perhaps where her den is. Uh, it could be Michelle but I think this lioness, well what's happened now, she's actually moved away from that drainage line so possibly heading off into an area where she could potentially go and hunt. Uh, that, that could be one reason, um, or try and just meet up with the rest of the pride if they are around. But perhaps she had come out of that drainage line and that's why she was at the dam earlier. Amazing to be able to follow an animal like this. Don't want to get too close so that we don't disturb her, just give her a bit of space. You can see she's not too phased by us. When these animals, if they do sh look like a like lion or leopard, doesn't matter what predator you're following, but if they do look like they are showing interest in potentially hunting some prey, we definitely back off, leave the lights off so that we don't disturb them or give their position away to the potential prey that they're trying to hunt. You know, as, as guides in this industry and showing people around and showing them the wilderness, we try and be as sensitive as possible and we try not to interfere at all with the natural um, behavior of these predators or of any animal for that matter. We don't want to give one or the other an advantage. So JJ has asked a question and he would like to know how dangerous this lioness is to me and to Vian. So JJ, no animal and not even this lioness at the moment or while we are following her, no animal is really dangerous. They can become potentially dangerous and the only time that happens is if we try and threaten them. All these animals view us as as a potential threat. We look very strange. We're not, we're not something that they see very often out in these areas. So to them we look like another predator, but a strange predator. We walk on two legs, walk upright. So we do look very different and strange. So she is actually more afraid of us than we are of her. But if we force it and we try and get too close or threaten them, they will act in a way that is aggressive to protect themselves. That's the only time animals become dangerous. It's when they want to protect themselves. So no animal is dangerous as such unless you try or you put yourself into a situation which could potentially become dangerous. Hope that answers your question, JJ. I just love this. This is fantastic. Being able to follow a lioness along the road just myself and Viam and the thousands of viewers around the world with us. It's incredible. Really, really incredible. So Heidi in Switzerland has just asked if we heard the other lions answering. There was just that one call, um, or two rather Heidi, that we heard them vocalize and return the lioness's roar. But I have not heard them again. So, uh, but they weren't too far, but I'm not sure if she, as I said, it doesn't look like she's, uh, she's heading in the direction which I actually heard the calls coming from. Those other calls sounded like they were coming from a south, southwesterly direction from where we were, but she seems to be heading more in an easterly direction now.
So Juliet has asked a question about the lion's roar and she would like to know if there is a pattern to the roar or do they just roar? Um, so Juliet, I think uh, if I understand the question correctly, are you trying to work out if, if there is a specific tone that they use um, or, or if they... Uh, I'm trying to think how I can explain it actually, it's quite difficult. Um, they, they, I wouldn't say there's a specific pattern, but they, they, they do have a, a distinct sound, a distinct call that all lions, all lions sound like. It's unmistakable with anything else. So it is a roar, but it, to an extent it is, a, is a, a pattern that you can very easily recognize. But the interesting thing is, I do think that every lioness, or sorry, not every lioness, every lion has got a call which is, which is slightly unique. And I think lions have the ability to determine which lions those are roaring. And they, they are able to, to recognize the voice or the call, the sound. And I think that's how they communicate with each other. I have seen male lions roaring on opposite sides of, a, of, a, of an area and, uh, and run straight towards each other and know that they are brothers, that they are just meeting up with, uh, with another dominant male, which is their brother, and they patrol an area together. So they definitely recognize each other's call. So, Marianne from Arkansas, I agree with you completely. It would be wonderful to see this lioness meeting up with the, the sister, her sisters or the, or the rest of the pride. That really would be amazing to see. You never know, we could be lucky and we might see it. She's just drifting off through that thicket there now. Off the road. Again, they are able to pinpoint the sound of where the other lions are calling from. It's incredible how they can do it. Um, with a bit of experience, you tend to get a bit better at, at pinpointing where the direction of lions come from, or where the lion's call comes from, but it's not always very easy. I'm just trying to see if we can find a gap through here. It's a bit thick there. Let's see, the road still continues along. We can still follow from this side. multitasking while I try and follow this lioness why don't you head back to James for an update and a goodbye nothing much to update everybody we've come back from Cheetah Plains we're on Juma it's been very pleasant indeed what a drive we've had and uh, I'm so pleased that that lion was calling there's nothing no better way to end the day than with a lion yelling into the darkness. Brilliant stuff. Now I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say goodbye to you immediately but until I get word let's just keep searching for little things through here. We have seen nothing with the spotlight so far I'm afraid. And uh, Byron very kindly said that he was going to ask me about multitasking with the spotlight. I have got unquestionably the most unsuccessful spotlighting technique I've ever witnessed myself, so I think that's a bad idea. Jamie, of course, much better at, at uh, multitasking, given her two X chromosomes and a generally large brain. So I think she, he'll have to wait to speak to Jamie to be able to multitask. There is a scrub here, which we are not going to disturb. It's a blindingly bright light. So I wonder, that lion has been lurking around Bivelshoek Dam for goodness knows how long now. Surely she must have cubs in that vicinity, unless she's the lioness from Torchwood and she's on her way back there. That's possible. 
But the Nkahuma pride is very fragmented at the moment. And I'm pretty sure that's because they're all in the, well, not all of them, at least two of them are in the process of either giving birth or raising very little babies. And when they're about six weeks old, then they should be introduced to the rest of the pride. In which case, we hopefully will be able to see a bit more of them. All right, everybody, it's been a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Thank you for coming along with Brian and I. We had a marvellous time, did we not, Brian? We did indeed. And there is the sun to say goodbye to you on this very cold Thursday or Friday evening. We'll see you tomorrow at 6 o'clock in turn, sorry, 6.30. Until then, go and see Brian and hopefully the lioness. Bye-bye. Right, everyone. So that lioness has just moved off through a thick area. We're unable to follow her any further. Maybe she's lucky and she meets up with the rest of the pride this evening. I'm sure they will at some stage. And we'll try again in the morning, come back into this area and see if we can't find maybe they're out at the waterhole again or somewhere else close by. It's been a fantastic afternoon. Elephant, we had, uh, we had James the leopard and the zebra and this beautiful lioness at the end. Really, really great day. It's been incredible. Hope you've all enjoyed it. Thank you to Via with me this this afternoon, it was great. Hope you enjoyed it too, Via. And uh, thank you to the ladies in the FC. Uh, always a great help having you support us. And thank you to the viewers especially. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. It's been great having all your questions and hopefully you've learnt a little bit along the way. Don't forget to join us tomorrow morning. It will be great to have you on drive with us again. And uh, thank you to James and Brian on the other vehicle. It's always great to be able to relay between James and myself. Have a wonderful evening and we will catch you tomorrow morning. Good night everybody and thank you again.